Well, hey everybody, Cliff Kelly here, coming to you again from lovely Colorado Springs in what we used to call back in the day, Indian Summer. It's October 21st, and the temperature yesterday was 80. Um, a lot of people might rejoice with that. I don't like it. I like fall. I want fall to be fall, summer to be summer, spring to be spring, winter to be sort of winter. After the 12th snowfall here, I'm about done with winter. Anyway, good to be with you. It is a pretty day in the midst of that opposite of that in world affairs. I got a call from my son early in the morning from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where he's finishing his doctorate. And we talked long about the Middle East uh, catastrophe. We can call it that. I may refer, I'm not going to teach on that today, but I may refer back to it uh, parenthetically, obliquely, uh, a couple of times today. Uh, but today's topic is the third time I've taken a run at it. I'm not sure why it takes another third time, but I felt, get the, I'm still trying to get the lighting right in here, uh, but I felt strongly that the Lord wanted me to give it another go. Let me give you the title and you'll see what I'm saying. It's of momentous importance right now for reasons that I'll try to develop as we go. Notes on leaving Babylon 3, Roman numeral 3, third effort. Last calls to depart from religious syncretism in America. Last calls. You know, when I say that, I've used it before over the last three years. God's last calls are just that. They're, they're last calls. I'm trying to work very hard to imitate what he's saying in the scriptures. Scout just walked in. He's uh, very parading around proud as a peacock. He uh, he just got back from the groomers. He's ever so handsome and he wants everybody to know it, but he won't go on camera. Can you get up there and show everybody? Can you see him? Can you see him over here? Well, no, just the back end. Um, and he's got a scarf on, so that means he'll be stepping out later. Uh, in any case, uh, this is the third go at this. This idea of Babylon, I'm going to develop it more, less ambiguously, uh, for better or for worse, as we proceed today. And uh, so let me open in prayer and get on with it. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you with joy and hope and fear and trembling, anguish and expectation all at once. It is the nature of being human in a time like this, in these last days. But I thank you for all of it. We run the gamut of experiences of emotions. I understand the more I study and get to know you, you also have a spectrum of emotions that you demonstrate. Everything from great exuberant joy to being quenched to being angry and everything in between. So we thank you that we are a reflection of you to the extent that we hear you, that we are near to you, that we study you and what your word says. I want only one thing today, Lord. I want to present you, not me, to the folks. I pray, Holy Spirit, therefore you would do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture for today is from Isaiah 52, 11 and 12. Could have selected several. This is the one I was led to. It's in the Amplified, which is a little more tedious but in some ways more nuanced and accurate. Depart, depart, go out from there, the lands of exile. Touch no unclean thing, exclamation point. Go out of the midst of her, that is Babylon, cleanse yourselves and be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord on your journey from there. For you will not go out in haste, nor will you go out in flight as was necessary when Israel left Egypt. This is different. You have time to prepare. A little. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and forgive me for amplifying an already amplified text. But everything I do, and one of the reasons I am such a critic of the American church, as was displayed last night at our big mega church, you have this historical... This historicist approach. We teach with excellence the very details of a great story, such as Elijah and the prophets of Baal. But what we do after that wonderful historical rendering, we just leave it there. That's it. Okay, I know biblical history and theology. I'm quite something. But never, 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 almost never is there an application to what's going on in the 
rather horrifying set of circumstances in the United States of America and certainly in at least two or three theaters in the world. I'm talking about obviously Israel and the Gaza. I'm talking about Ukraine. I'm talking about the South China Sea. Nobody talks about that. I, in fact, I wasn't going to say this, but last night it was bringing forth an excellent historical piece on Elijah. And this is, this is about the umpteenth time I've heard this church, doesn't matter who's teaching, talk about, you know, God will provide everything that you need, shaken down, etc., etc., and then the tithe was mentioned. Almost every single, huh, sometimes bad words come to mind, sermon has to say something about tithing and money. Why? Because they got a $33 million a year budget that they've got to meet, and they're behind. Okay, didn't mean to go on the tirade, but I'm so tired of it. I'm so weary of it. I'm trying to make the point that there are bigger things going on in the world and in the country and in the sanctuaries of our churches today than making more money, uh, and everybody does worry about their bills, I get it, but there's just something larger, more transcendent, more demanding of those of us who are Christians that we need to attend to both by prayer, thought, and action. Quotation today is from Alan Kreider, a Christian writer, in a work called The Change of Conversion and the Origin of Christendom. He writes this, Missiologists have in recent years begun to think seriously about something called enculturation. And we'll define that as we go. And historians have begun to learn from them. When the Christian message is inserted into a cultural framework, whether it's America or Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter. If the messengers are insensitive to the local culture, the result can be cultural imperialism. And America and the West have done plenty of that. On the other hand, if they grant too much hegemony to the local culture, the result at best is syncretism, and at worst, something called Christo-paganism. That is, you can hardly recognize the Christian canon anymore as it's filtered down through these various pagan doctrines. This is mostly the responsibility or uh, uh, the, uh, the commission of the traditional church that did that, and still to some extent does. Things are most wholesome, he concludes, when sensitive interchange takes place, leading to a truly critical symbiosis. Oh, a little mistake here. Symbiosis. Da, 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 da. Meaning a healthy balance between protecting the canon, protecting the gospel, and its accuracy and integrity on the one hand, but being respectful of the culture on the other, and as with the four Gospels, making adjustments to the audience without tampering or compromising the text. First thoughts, Superman. Uh, grew up in the 1950s in a South California desert town, San Bernardino, California. Uh, we had the first, it's not a boast, we didn't have much, but we had the first TV on the block uh, on Leroy Avenue. Uh, gosh, I remember it, 2537 Leroy, after all these millions of years, I remember it. And we had a Packard Bell, 17-inch screen with big, huge console dials all over the place, big, booming bass speakers on the bottom. And uh, we had three stations in the outer Los Angeles area that we could attempt to, NBC, CBS, and ABC. I remember, I don't, which, I don't know which network, I was watching in the 1950s the original black and white Superman series. Now, why do I mention all that? There is a point to my madness. Listen to the narrative that most of us can remember if we're past, I don't know, 35, 40 years old. I'm double that. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from the planet Krypton who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for, and here's the catchphrase, that every American knew by heart by the, by the turn of the, the decade, 1960. In the never-ending battle for truth, 
justice and you can probably finish it the American way. That was the narrative for America in the early 50s in post-war America that had just almost miraculously in just four straight four short years defeated Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, all of the Axis allies, and pretty much sat in control of international foreign policy for generations following. So I make the connection between the narrative of Superman and the narrative of the then single uh, unipower superpower, the United States of America, that stayed fixed in place for decades following. We were quite something. We sort of thought ourselves as supermen and superwomen. We did. I'm not exaggerating the point. The whole idea of American exceptionalism and all of the somewhat defensible and largely indefensible presuppositions that flow from that idea came out of this era. No one had ever achieved what America did between 1941 and 1945. It's still, it's still extraordinary by any historical reckoning. Indeed, the family, I have to read now and then, indeed, the entire family of nations for a time embraced this modern template as the moral, military, and economic epicenter of international foreign policy and world order. Henry Luce, the founder of Time Magazine, I've noted this before, called this the beginning of the American century, that America was the dominant force for better or for worse, we certainly thought for better back then, after the end of the Second World War, of the entire world. We were it. And I think it's fair to say, it's not in the text, on reflection, that America wants to be that again. And down underneath knows that it's not that anymore. To state the obvious with still another classic American media catchphrase, beloved, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is not the America of 1950, 51, and 52. This is not the America of Superman anymore. This is not the America that we, some of us who are older, remember growing up in. It's a different America today, and it's migrating to a brand new place that frankly terrifies me, not for myself, but for the culture and hundreds of millions of Americans and people around the world. America's going somewhere, beloved, and it's not a good place. Okay, let me pick up where I left off. So I, I pose the question that all of us have asked probably several times in the last eight years or so, what happened to us? What happened to the America from the lofty pinnacle of world domination and power and for good, the defense of, you know, those who couldn't defend themselves, although that, that, that becomes somewhat arguable. As you see, I'm still trying to get the lighting right here. What happened to us in the last 10 years or more that so characterizes so much of the current American condition? How did we fall? so fall, fall so far in just 70 years, which is something we could discuss in the length of many textbooks. But for now, I'm going to reduce it to simple structures based on, as best I can by looking again to the, the responsible scholarship that we can find in, uh, in recognized journals. Most of them are from a conservative perspective, but not all. Some are from progressive views, some are conservative. You know, the whole definition of conservative, conservatism is out the window today, as you well know, for those of you who still read. I turn, therefore, to a superb analysis for this second part labeled The Decline of American Greatness. Dr. Nick Bryant, a history graduate from Cambridge with a PhD in American politics from Oxford. Yeah, I'm bragging a little bit. He is the author of When America Stopped Being Great published in 2017, the very same year that I published my tiny little, tiny little book, The Sixth Seal, and 100 years almost to the month after Leon Trotsky prophesied that the West would end up in the ash heap of history in 1917 during the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. 
So let me give you some snippets of his basic points. They're, I think, quite compelling. The first point, dominance. And I quote, all of this will be a quote. In those twilight years of the last millennium, from 1984 to 2000, America enjoyed something akin to the dominance achieved at the Los Angeles Olympic, just two years after Ronald Reagan demanded that Gorbachev tear down that wall, that concrete and ideological barricade was gone. It seemed that nothing we wanted to do was impossible to us in 1984. The United States won the Cold War and the New World Order that emerged afterwards. It became the sole superpower in a unipolar world. World. The speed at which U.S.-led forces won the first Gulf War in 1991, in a matter of days, if not hours, was breathtaking. I remember the heaviness of that. Good night. Wow. We, we're, we're back in the saddle again, to quote my old friend Gene Autry. We're back in the saddle again. We're where we're supposed to be all this time. There's more here, but I can't read all the details. Second, however, is the point that I label shattered confidence, or he labels. The national story changed dramatically and unexpectedly soon after this, while doomsday predictions of a, U, a Y2K bug, remember that? Everything was going to stop and God was going to come back, uh, and, and electronics and everything was going to be shut down. Predictions of a Y2K bug failed to materialize. It nonetheless felt as if the United States had been infected with a virus. 2000s saw the dot-com bubble collapse uh, in November, the disputed presidential election between George Bush and Al Gore. Al Gore badly damaged the reputation of the democracy. It was so close. It was days until they knew who was really president, until Gore somewhat graciously resigned uh, his, his holdout. The year 2001 brought the horror of September 11th, and that is one of those historic pivots that I can't emphasize strongly enough, that was several things at once, depending on your theology, depending on your political ideology. Number one for me is, it was a stunning, violent, bloody wake-up call to America. And I'm not saying for one minute that God did it, but he wanted to use it as a wake-up call to America. I remember I don't know, the, the United States came together and everybody's going to church. Everybody's flying flags from their cars and trucks and windows and yards for about 45 days. And then it went away. There was no solid reuniting of the disparate United States even after that. And he writes more about that. Finally, uh, next he comes to something called the hangover. Following the Obama years, it is tempting to see Donald Trump's 2016 victory. We're leaping forward. The article is much longer, has more detail, but for the sake of time, I'm coming forward. It is tempting to see Donald Trump's 2016 victory as an aberration, a historical mishap. The election all came down after all. I didn't know this till I read the article. To just 77,744 votes in three key states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. It was that close. But when you consider the boom to bust cycle of the period between 1984 and 2016, this precipitous fall, despite what Trump claims, that was indeed breathtaking. The Trump phenomenon doesn't look so accidental. When things get really, really tough, history teaches us, people look for a savior, and it's usually not Jesus. They're looking for a political messiah. That is exactly what he's proposing and with which I strongly agree. In the 1994 congressional midterms, the Republican revolution that began to emerge under the leadership, house leadership of Newt Gingrich and others, a, the, I, I emphasize this in the, in the boldface, a wave of fierce partisans, this is 1994 now, don't forget it, a wave of fierce partisans um, uh, brought were brought to Washington with an ideological aversion, a radical aversion to government and thus little investment in making it work. They just wanted to shake things up. Later, that would migrate into a position of just, we want to tear things down. Think of Steve Bannon and his chaos, political theory of chaos. You know, he claimed to be a Marxist at one point. Let's just tear it all down and start all over. 
That's a sense of the spirit that's emerging in contemporary American politics. And I am saddened to say has come into our churches. The birther movement led by yours truly, not, not yours truly, but your beloved Donald Trump tried to delegitimize, delegitimize, uh, legitimize Barack Obama with specious and racist claims that he was not born in Hawaii. I fell for it. Dear God, I did. Not proud of it. Over this period, the political discourse also became shriller. Rush Limbaugh comes to the stage. After getting his first radio show in 1984, rose to become the king of the right-wing shock jocks. And that's where we started getting our, there, our metal, our, our giddy-up in, 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 in our persona, in our presentation, in our attitude, in our arrogance, in our power orientation. That we just need to be radical and mean. Rush Limbaugh was a big part of that. I used to listen to Rush. I was never a ditto, but I used to listen to him on my long trips across the country. See how I'm doing on time. Got to get going. Trump's America is the next and final select section that before his conclusion. Over the past few months, this was written in 2017, I followed another new trend, gun violence. Multiple, now again, I'm a, you know, a second amendment guy. I carry all the time, me and my Smith & Wesson Shield 9mm named Freddo don't go anywhere without each other. Anywhere, for reasons I've told you about before. But listen to his argument. Multiple shootings are not new, of course. Just days before I arrived in the States in 1984, a gunman had walked into a McDonald's in a suburb of San Diego and shot dead 21 people. It was then the deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history. What's different between now and then? is the regularity of these massacres. Since 2017, that's become horrifically more obvious. And no, I'm not saying take away all the guns, but that's probably what's going to happen within three to five years, if things continue, except to remain in the hands of the despots. What would young people make of the continue, the, this confluence of gun violence and race Evident in the spate of police shootings of unarmed black men. Yeah, I know I sound like a liberal. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've studied it. I know the stats. I know the, I know the numbers. And I know the reasons. Unarmed black men and in the online auction where the weapon that killed Trayvon Martin fetched more than $100,000. Got to have that gun, Martha. That's quite something. And then there was Charlottesville with its torch-wielding, hate-spewing neo-Nazis. I've still got a picture of them, torches in hand, marching down the lane. Reminiscent in every way of neo-Nazism was another low point. So too were the president's remarks afterwards when he described the crowd there as including some very nice people. Holy mackerel! And the church just yawned. It's still yawning. Got to have a jaw ache by this time. It's still yawning. Turning away. Ignoring. Dr. Bryant's conclusion, then I get a lot skeptical, skeptical wonder. He wants to go prance around and show himself off throughout the rest of the house. Dr. Bryant's conclusion, and I quote finally, there's still truth in the adage that America is always, <laughs> America is always going to hell, but it never quite gets there. Excuse me. There he comes. But now that is being tested. It feels like we're going to hell in a handbasket. I used to say hay basket until my, st my students corrected me. Presently, it feels more like a con... I'm, I love hate this in the sense that it's tragically true. Presently, it feels more like a continent than a country with shared land occupied, occupied by warring tribes. That's the America of 2023. It's just there. It's quiet sometimes, but it's there. Not yet a falling state, but not a united state. We're not united. We're not. And the heartbreaker is I don't see anything that's going to unite us so long as we keep stiffing and straight arming the God of the scriptures or redefining him in our own image. Lost my place.
as I've traveled, the author writes, as I've traveled this country, I struggle to identify where Americans will find common political ground ever again. I agree with him. Sadly. Not in the guns debate. We'll never agree on that. I'm not about to give up my gun, but I understand the arguments of those who've been slaughtered by bad actors. Almost always white men. That bothers me. Almost always young white men. Look at the data for yourselves. Not in the guns debate, not in the abortion debate. Can't even agree on that anymore. Not in the health care debate, not even in the singing of the national anthem at American football games. Even a cataclysmic event, cataclysmic event on the scale of 9-11 failed to ultimately unify the country, nor has the immigration issue, which tears me apart. Of a man of Mexican descent, my people come from Tex-Mex, El Paso, Juarez. I understand that the United States Army uh, captured, took uh, 500 square, 500,000 square miles, or is it 500, can't be 500 million, 500,000 square miles of Mexico. I've named the states before under the aegis of manifest destiny. Well, we're here and we're stronger, so it's ours. In light of this, and that's the end of the quote, in light of this Alexis de Tocqueville-like, Tocqueville-esque, outsider's view of an America splintering into disparate shards, we must ask the ultimate question, where is all this taking the nation? Where are we going? Got a, uh, an election coming up uh, soon here. We've got a massively important historical election next November. 2024. And whoever sits behind that resolute desk on January 20th, 2025, will determine the final destiny of the United States of America. We've come to that point. We're way past the Rubicon. That's where we are. So let's go to the teaching from Isaiah 52 about departing from Babylon. The key term here is depart from the Hebrew sur, S-U-R, to turn aside or away from, to eschew or leave, or call back, away from, to desert or withdraw from, to quit and keep far away from, to remove, to put aside, as with the shedding of soiled clothing, to depart from the way of apostasy. That's the definition of the word, the command of Almighty God, get out of Babylon because it's filthy. Hard for you to hear, you American patriots, isn't it? America's filthy. It's gone from being something, and even this is arguable anymore, something grand and great, at least potentially, good and wholesome and wanting to set other people free while it kept its own people in bondage, by the way, to this, what we see outside. Again, my Data and survey research is one part of this. The other is just my endless conversations in coffee shops with people, Christians, mostly white, some of color, what they're going to do in the November election. Military included, police included, first responders included, Christians, dozens of them anyway, and usually with head held down, what are you going to do next fall? It's either... I don't know, but mostly, overwhelmingly, it's can't vote for Biden. Trump has got us locked in. I could have used another phrase, but better not. He's got us. He's got the GOP. He's got the business community. He's got the church. He's got the military. 55% mm, or so, maybe 60. Got the police. Got the major institutions that aren't liberal. See, that's the irony here. He's got the conservative church to America in the palm of his sweaty little hand. I don't know what's going to change that. Prison. Hitler went to prison and became chancellor and president a few years after he got out. Anyway, 
let me define syncretism for you. Not everybody is familiar with the term, still watching the time. The amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. And I rather like this part. Interfaith dialogue. You know, let's sit down over coffee and talk about it. Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It sounds right. Sounds right. My son is kind of of that opinion. We talked about that at length today. But it can easily slip into syncretism because syncretism involves the merging or assimilation of several original discrete traditions, <coughs> especially in the theology and mythology of religion, thus asserting, asserting, but not being able to prove, an underlying unity allowing for an inclusive approach to other faiths. For this kind of unity, I've already taught the lesson on false unity. If, if this kind of unity is what the world and the UN is looking for, which it is, this will be the final death blow to Christendom as we know it, the final death blow to what is usually referred to erroneously as Christian America. Because Christianity must give up rich canonical ground in order to come to that kind of unity. It's, it's, it is a conundrum. It is a paradox. It is almost an unsolvable riddle. Commentary this time from Joseph Benson. Depart ye, go out ye from thence out of Babylon into your own land. Make the Christian application here without me doing it. That there I may meet with you and bless you and perform those further and greater things for you, which I have promised to do there. And this invitation was the more necessary because God foresaw that a great number of the Jews would upon worldly considerations continue in those foreign countries in which they were settled and would be very backward to return to the Holy Land. We want to stay here. We ought to go back to Egypt. At least we had three squares a day and, you know, a decent house to live in. America is in precisely the same compromised position, starting with the church. Got to keep our stuff. It's better this than, you know, risking it all by voting for a Democrat. Touch no unclean thing. Carry not along with you any of their superstitions or idolatries. My God, QAnon is sitting in the church. MAGA Christian nationalism is flooding the aisles of the church. It's everywhere. God, it's everywhere. This has already infected the church. I don't see any disinfectant coming along because pastors will not address it. You won't. I listen to you. I survey national sermons. I can't hear it. Now, the little churches, again, that aren't online, I don't know what's going on down there. But the influencers, y'all are making a whole lot of trouble by not addressing it. He goes on, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, and especially you priests and Levites and pastors and teachers and elders and presbyters, especially you who minister in holy things and carry the holy vessels of the temple. Keep yourselves from all pollution, and you have not done so. You shall not go out by flight, but securely and in triumph being conducted by your great captain, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you obey and only if you obey him and honor him and stay loyal to him and his book, his law. Yeah, I know. Christians aren't supposed to talk about the law. Then the God of Israel will be your reward so that none shall be able to oppose you in your march or fall upon you in the rear, because he's a rear guard. But with the mass disobedience going on in the church and America today, we have no rear guard, beloved. He's not there. I dare say I've mentioned it before. I wonder if he's in the sanctuaries of these big mega hotshot churches teaching a sweetie pie gospel to keep folks happy. I don't think he's there. I don't think he's there. My comment here, there's so much here to even 
start to digest. First and foremost, again, this is the third time this passage has come to me. Second, it is of the utmost importance and urgency to God that we address this still one more time. Third, I am convinced down to my marrow that this admonition is the core of what God is doing as he is continuing, and I've taught on this two or three times now, he's sifting us. He's sifting us in his great winnowing fork. And he's doing what? He's sifting out all the tares from the real, real wheat, the true follower, which is a small minority, a remnant of the so-called American church or any church, just a few, comparative few. Usually it's a tear bench of 10% or so. So get ready for the adventure of your lifetime, boys and girls. Just this one last ride into the narrowing horizon of history as we have known it. It's coming to an end as we have known it. That's why you see so many times on the news, no matter they're reporting on the ecology or politics, war and peace, uh, cultural difficulties, unprecedented. Well, we've never seen this before. This section I call slouching toward Babylon, borrowing shamelessly from a couple of sources, Robert Bork's Lament Over American Liberalism, published in 19, 6, 1996, uh, Slouching Toward Gomorrah, brilliant book, and then finally Slouching Toward Jerusalem by John Mayer, <coughs> published <coughs> more recently in 2012. In his more relevant, penetrating analysis of what he calls reactive nationalism. Nationalism that Trump is feeding and fueling by the hour is, is a, react, a, desperate, a desperate grab for getting back what we've already lost. You see, American greatness, if it was ever in place, was based on a firm grasp of the true Christ. The true one, not the one you see and hear about today in the church. The true one. And there's this desperation, same thing as in Germany a century ago, after being humiliated after World War I, Hitler rose and promised them all the things they wanted to be again. Dominant great force in Europe. And we know the consequences of that painfully indeed. So this is what I see happening in America, beloved, not so much even slouching anymore, but now racing to become what I'm going to propose now almost absolutely as the biblical Babylon of the book of Revelation chapters 16 and 17, uh, 16 through 18. A last day's world superpower in its waning years, literally hell-bent on maintaining its grip on world domination at any cost, at any cost, by draconian measures so diabolical that I believe it deserves God's most violent punishment in American history to date. And it's coming. It's coming because we're not turning. It's coming because we're not repentant. It's coming, it's coming because we've retained, retained even more of our, of our avarice toward material gain or material hold, even at the cost of Christ listening to a despot who is the bottom of the rung by any moral or ethical measure. We would rather have him. Give us Barabbas. What need have we of this Jesus? Dr. Stephen Anderson is another person I borrow from, and I'm running out of time, so I have to skip some. Him is highly regarded, he is a highly regarded authority on the book of Revelation, who I've read several times now. And, and most of them are, including perhaps me, are not nearly as, as careful as this scholar. He wrote <clears throat> and published in 2021, The Case for Identifying Babylon the Great with the United States of America, in a journal article <clears throat> that's been cited by many sources. Some bullet points, again, I'm just going to have to buzz through them to finish on time. First, traditionally, most not all pre-tribulation or pre-wrath, that's me, I'm not pre-trib, I'm pre-wrath, don't have time to go through that again. Interpreters have differentiated the Babylon the Great of Revelation 17 from the Babylon of the Great in Revelation 18, arguing that Revelation 17 speaks of an apostate church, 
symbolically as a prostitute, and that Revelation 18 describes a literal city, a political entity. He makes the case, rightly or wrongly, I'll give ground on this, that both refer to primarily a political entity. The reason I agree with him is the Antichrist is a politician. He's the final politician of the world. This is political with massive theological, doctrinal, doctrinal and, and obviously moral underpinnings. Second, virtually all writers refer to Babylon the Great as Babylon, which tends to leave the... Okay, this gets so detailed. You can read the second graph as his proof text of why Babylon the Great cannot be historical Babylon, the place in the Middle East. I remember reading articles, oh, they're going to restore it and rebuild. We kept looking, there ain't nothing going on there. So it must be 100 and 200 years off before. No, that was never the right exegesis, never the right interpretation. Third, according to Revelation 17, 16, and 17, Babylon the Great, this is <clears throat> theologically accurate, but I'd not seen it until I read his piece. According to Revelation 17, 16, and 17, Babylon the Great is destroyed by the Antichrist and the ten kings and the European alliance that comprise his base of power. Let me read a little further. Prior to this time, and he's got scripture texts, proofs, Prior to this time, Babylon the Great has dominated world politics and has controlled the world economy for three and a half years from the base in what he proposes as America. Since Revelation 13, 3 through 7 presents the Antichrist kingdom as the dominant world power during the second half of the tribulation period, and Revelation 13 shows that he controls the world's economic system throughout the second half of the tribulation period, Babylon the Great must be destroyed before the midpoint of the tribulation period, three and a half years in, when he commits the abomination of desolation in the holy place. Certainly the fact that Babylon, Babylon the Great is destroyed by Antichrist militaries as a threat to his larger dreams of hegemony and domination, rather than directly from heaven, argue strongly for its fall occurring before the second advent. Last two points. A study of Revelation 17 again shows that Babylon the Great is the world's greatest superpower in the end times on the earth. Now stop and think. Who is that? Who is that? Even in our decline. America is still regarded as the major superpower of the planet. He goes on, the following facts emerge <clears throat> from an analysis of this section of the book of Revelation. So a mistake. One, Babylon the Great has the largest economy of any entity in the world. It is the center of wealth in the world and it is responsible for an extended period of global wealth creation in the end times. Two, Babylon the Great has shaped global culture in the end times, lots of mistakes here, in a directly anti-Christian manner, takes on more of the dictatorship rather than the Republican form of governance. Third, Babylon the Great has the greatest political power of any entity in the end times. There's still no match to us in terms of our worldwide distribution of military power and economic power. Fourth, Babylon the Great is considered to have the strongest military in the world of the end times, although that's in disarray as well. They can't seem to recruit people anymore as they watch what's going on in our country and around the world. All of these characteristics, he concludes, and uniquely and definitively match the United States of America. Look, at this point, after looking at this, gosh, I started reading and thinking about this when David Wilkerson came out in the, seven, in the late 70s and early 80s with this idea. I uh, mentioned it before, I thought he was a lunatic. I dismissed it out of hand. I no longer dismiss it out of hand. In summary, the book of Revelation describes Babylon the Great as the dominant superpower in the world of the end times, so dominant that it actually shapes the culture and economy of the world as it exists at the start of the tribulation period. I watch all these music shows, The Voice, uh, Britain's Got Talent, Somalia's Got Talent. I mean, everybody's got the show on. Do you know what songs they sing primarily? Except in France, American songs. Just one small example, American songs. 
is such that only one such entity could ever exist in the history of the world. And there is no doubt in his mind or mine anymore <clears throat> that the United States of America is this entity. While some aspects of the prophecy remain to be fulfilled, most notably the prophecies of Babylon the Great's attempts to put Christians to death worldwide, enough aspects already match so as to leave no doubt as to the fulfillment of the rest. So there it is, right or wrong, after especially the last intense eight years, I have no other conclusion to draw. I see America intransigent, unmovable from its apostasy and its compromise and its indifference and its cowardice uh, in the church. I, I don't see a whisper of a move. I'm a pretty good observer. I'm a trained observer. It's just not there. It's just not there. So my final thoughts. If America is Babylon the Great, as we have argued, then what does leaving Babylon mean? I know a number of my friends are already making plans to go expate, move to another country. I've joked even with my wife before that if the Lord wanted us to, we would move to either Israel or the UK, where my son may be teaching at Cambridge, may not be. That sounds horrible to a lot of American ears. But I must confess to you, can't lie, I may be wrong. I find less and less loyalty to this country the more and more I see it. Torture basic Christian ethics. I can't support where it's going. I can't support its leadership. I can't support what it's done to the Constitution. I can't support what it does to people of color. I can't support its arrogance. Can't support any of it as a Christian. I can't. So I have, as I begin to conclude, come out of her, my people. More like, come out of her, my people. That's the voice of the Lord. And I have to skip now to the end. And I tell you, based on the theology summarized in this and many other pieces, all who choose to remain in this Babylonian America, this compromised, this wretched entity called Christian nationalism, MAGA, QAnon, whatever the blanket is, all who choose to remain in Babylon shall perish. Pastor, try telling your people that. If you have the stones for it, that's what the canon teaches. That's what God demands that you teach. For my last thoughts, then, I turn to a blogger called Natan, a Messianic Jew. Um, and I don't know that I have too much time to lay it out. But here's what he says in an article entitled what it means to come out of Babylon the Great. Right to our point as we conclude. First, repent of sin. Pastor, starts with you. Repent privately in your study with the Lord. Repent to your family and then get in your pulpit and apologize to the church. Tell them that you were wrong to be silent these last eight years. He writes why. Second, Read and study the Bible, not just the commentaries, not just what Eugene Peterson has taught you in his version of the scriptures. Read and study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation anew, as I was forced to do, starting seven, eight years ago. I was forced to do it. I didn't have any noble, oh, I, I've got to do this, Lord. Couldn't go to work, so I had nothing else to do. Be resolved ahead of time to do what Yahweh tells you to do to bring your life into conformity with his word. <sighs> no matter the cost, Pastor, your job, your six-figure salary, your big house on the hill, your 30-acre farm, etc., etc., it's nothing to God. It sure is nothing to me. Third, once you start discovering the real truth of the Bible from a fresh perspective, as the Holy Spirit would honor your humility, start conforming your life to the truth of it. Start living a set-apart life. Don't be like all the rest. 
somebody wanted to say, uh, somebody was writing something just yesterday or this morning that I read. There's a certain mold of white Christianity that everybody wants to fit into. I see it everywhere. There was a time that I wanted to be that. Dear God, I find it repulsive now. I don't want to be a member of the mold. Double entendre. Unintentional, but there it is. Be set apart. Be different for Christ. That's the only way your witness will have any merit or power at all. Right now, you're nothing. You're a gelding. You have, you have no witness. Wow, I love Jesus and Donald Trump's my guy. Fourth and finally, let go of religious or other non-biblical traditions of men that violate or have superseded the word of Elohim. Lots of proof text. Don't make excuses. Just do it. Just obey Yahweh Elohim and his word. If you follow these points, you will be heeding Yahweh's, Yeshua's call to come out of spiritual Babylon by first getting the leaven of Babylon out of your own heart, pastor. Out of your own heart, teacher. Out of your own heart, evangelist. Out of your own heart, Mr. Graham. Start there and then tell your people what they must do as well. Coda. Of the many sins in the Decalogue, an individual might continue to practice that could condemn him or hurt a perdition, whatever you call yourself. There is one that assure eternal destruction, and that is idolatry. Exodus 20, 1 through 3 says it perfectly. It hasn't moved an inch. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods or messiahs or saviors before me. You shall have none. I've argued for over three years now, more like eight, that those willful followers of Donald Trump's MAGA Christian nationalism movement, the QAnon cult worship, and all the rest of these doctrines of demons that the apostles address so clearly that supplant Christ and canon with earthly political power shall be consigned to the flame. Oh, Dr. Kelly, you're just a heretic. What if I'm right? What if I've properly read the canon? What if I properly understood the teachings of Christ and John and Paul and all the rest? What if I understand now what I didn't understand eight years ago? The scriptures, I believe, are absolutely relentlessly clear on the penalty for sustain, sustained unrepentant idolatry, no matter what label the sinner claims. I turn, of all things, of all sources, to Wikipedia, the editors, and what they label as a biblical, the biblical narrative. Even the atheists, even the unbelievers understand it better than the church. The first and most important commandment was that Christians must not worship any God other than the Lord. Whoever violated this commandment should be killed. And Exodus 22, 20 reads, whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be destroyed. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. There is no shadow of turning in him. His yea is yea, his nay is nay. He's the same God in the Old Testament as in the New. It's the same law that you are called by the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of Christ, following Christ to obey. Best you can. Not perfectly, but the best you can. Since many in the Christian church in America today deny that this Old Testament warning applies to them, perhaps the voice of heaven will persuade. Revelation 21.8. I've said this once before. I say it again for point of emphasis. Here are those who will not go to the kingdom of God. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I can't make it any clearer than that. You don't get a buy. You don't get a pass. You don't get to pass go and not go to jail. You don't get that just because you wear the label Christian and disobey the most central commandments 
of the Decalogue fulfilled in Christ, the true Messiah. You can't have other gods, whether it's a big house or a filthy political leader. You can't have it. You can't make alliance with it. You can't make alliance with it. Do not be unequally yoked to that extent that you lose it all. I conclude. I can add nothing more than to admonish and shout if I must, which I've done today, to many people who I know and love to come out of Babylon, which shape-shifted into the contemporary American form of a vicious political ideology as it did a hundred years ago in Germany that sucked in both the Catholic and the Protestant churches, that is the very center of the Antichrist system described by the canon. If you truly love Jesus, if you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ, then only one searing command comes to you straight from heaven into what I hope is your heart of repentance, and that is stop it and stop it now, says the Lord. Father, I don't know. I don't know. I tried Wednesday to offer a softer tone, softer touch, more like a, you know, thing of the FDR's fireside chats. You know, the old grandfather just having a chit-chat with his folks. Lost half of my audience. There's a message there. You have commanded me unless my ears have grown so full of myself or or this, uh, this chariot that I'm now riding, it feels like a chariot of fire, to not tone down the message because people are dying by the hundreds of millions for foul doctrine, for cowardly presentation, for compromised theology, for the fear of man, the love of mammon, the love of political power, the love of America, which is a, a kind of a new golden calf above and beyond Christ. I can't say it any plainer or louder or more, sometimes fiercely. I hope to God this penetrates somebody's armor, a pastor here, a pastor there, to think and at least go into the prayer closet all by themselves and not come out until they hear the voice of the Lord. Please, God, turn this around. All of history and even eschatology is against it, but some will turn, and I pray for those few, as with Jude, who says we can snatch a few out of the fire. In Christ's name, amen. Well, there you have it, boys and girls. The old man's back in the saddle, like it or not. This is how the Lord has told me to talk. And I can't deny what he's told me to do. Love you.